cannot be episode two. Can it? I fear so, fair lady. Maya Govanen. What's up? In Sindarin, the language of grey elves. I'm the talking shirt, and I have seen the second episode of Amazon's The Rings of Power. I am impressed by how bad the experience was. Today we'll talk a lot about the writing itself. Let's get right into it. Warning, spoilers ahead. The episode starts when the last ended. We see Galadriel looking at the stars. Which is in the middle of the sea. And that's basically it for the scene. But we need to talk about the fact that Galadriel uh, practically committed suicide. As she jumped off the ship, uh, she can't have hope of finding land, as we have seen in the previous episode. Valinor is not a place that you can get in a normal way. So she have to she has to seek uh, rescue somewhere else and what hope does she have of survival where will she find land where will she find food where will she find water uh, her decision led to the situation that she effectively killed herself and uh, hope of, uh, of getting help is minimal then we move to nori and poppy her friend that just appears they look at the strange man that has fallen from the sky in flames. Nori tries to get to him, and then by chance she discovers that the flames that surround the man aren't really hot. It's another stopping point, because we see later in this episode that the matter will not be brought up, and I fear that this will be the case for the whole show. We'll, we are still, of course, yet to see the rest. But based on what we have already seen, this won't be used. But I would really like to know, why isn't the fire hot? Will it be used later? Will we learn the nature of this fire? Or is it just a meaningless, meaningless detail? that is added to create an illusion of creativity. If it's not put into use, if it's not explored and explained, then it's just meaningless. It's the same as making the fire green without any explanation, because there is no weight to this change and this detail. But we are to see what they will do with it. Now back to the plots, the stranger wakes up, grabs Nori by hand, and then weird things start to happen. Wind starts blowing, the rocks start floating, the fire flickers, but the man soon loses his consciousness and everything ends. Then the two hobbits, let's call them what they are, carry him away on a cart and Poppy constantly com complains about the whole situation, the whole situation, and she says that the rest of the hobbits, if they discover what they have done by wandering away and meeting with that man, will blame everything bad that will happen to the community on two girls. Are we just to assume that the others wouldn't help somebody in need? The counter-argument that Nori gives is reasonable, that she won't leave this man to be alone, to be eaten by the wolves. And later, Nori adds another line that is very interesting. I know it sounds strange, but somehow, I just know it's important. Somehow. Remember the word. It may be the key word to understand this whole show. Now, we move to Bronwyn and Arondir. They search Bronwyn's home village and they see that it has been destroyed from the underground. There is a tunnel, but there are no bodies of the villagers. Arondir tells Bronwyn to go and warn her people and he jumps into the tunnel. 
I have to ask, do all elves blind themselves with torches? Now we move to Celebrimbor and Elrond in Eregion. There we see Feanor's hammer being admired by the two of them. It's a hammer of the creator of the Silmarils. But uh, then we see Elrond explaining to Celebrimbor what the Silmarils are. In fact, he is doing that for audience, but the writers do not know any better ways to introduce the information, so they do so that Elrond, in the presence of the greatest artif elven artificer of his age, must explain the concept of Silmarils, the greatest work of art that has ever been made. Because writers didn't find any better way to introduce that information. But there are simply better ways. It can be shown right off the bat. Is that Thanos Summer? Yes. I often wonder, how was a mere tool able to bind the light of the trees of Valinor? Alas, Thanos took his secrets to the grave and will probably never know how he created the Cinemarils. It may not be perfect, but it's certainly better than Elrond providing just bare exposition. Well, now a throwback to the, light, to the last video. We see now that the show acknowledges the history of the Silmarils, but it doesn't want to deal with its consequences. The Silmarils, sure, they are, or their name, but they are used only to prove that it's, the show is based on Tolkien's works. But is it really? The show ignores the real meaning of the story of the Silmarils and grants the power to give passage to the Valinor to Gilgalad. The history of the Silmarils is effectively ignored. Well, back to Celebrimbor, we hear now that he wants to build a forge. I wonder what for. Maybe the answer could be found in the title of the show. But we learn also that he wants it to be built by spring. Why? I asked the same question, but I didn't get an answer. Well, is it before the reason? Elves are eternal beings. They can wait in patience. If the time limit is granted, it means that the show really needs it, really needs the tension. But, again, writers cannot think of a good way to introduce it. So why not just say that the forge must be built by spring? Then, problem solved, how convenient, and you didn't even need to think of a reason. But the problem with that approach is that whatever it includes, whatever solution will it bring, it's meaningless, because, because there is no meaning. And right after, we learn about another artificial constraint. Celebrimbor says that the High King cannot grant him any people to help him with his project. This problem is even deeper because it stays in direct opposition to what we know. Haven't there been, haven't there been recently many elves returning from duty in the Southland? They certainly return to their home and they want to devote their time to something meaningful, to art, to beauty. But hiking cannot spur none of them, only Elrond. You see, those constraints were needed to achieve a goal, to somehow achieve it. And now, Elrond and Celebrimbor do a reasonable thing, then they turn to the dwarves for help. But remember, they do that only because of those meaningless problems. Then we see our two elves at the gates of Moria. 
Elrond explains to Celebrimbor that Durin, the prince of the dwarves, is his close friend. Someday surely will be welcomed warmly. But soon we discover that Elrond is denied entrance, uh, but he invokes some traditional dwarven right and he is let in. Celebrimbor goes back to, to a region. We learn that the right that Elrond invoked uh, is a competition between him and a dwarven representative, who turns out to be Durin, and the competition is who will smash more rocks with the hammer. If Elrond wins, he'll be granted right he will be granted right to present his one request, but if he loses, he will be banished from all dwarven realms. Durin seems very pleased with thought of banishing his friend, and the competition starts. Then we go back to Nori, who meets the stranger again, and the stranger seems to be trying to communicate with her and give her some kind of a message. He is speaking a different language though, so they cannot com communicate effectively. So he tries drawing something on the ground with a twig. Uh, this attempt proves uh, to be unsu unsuccessful, but his actions seem to have an effect of no on Nori's father, who is working in a far distance. When the stranger breaks the twig, uh, Nori's father twists an ankle. And then we see Galadriel. Galadriel is still swimming on the sea. And suddenly she sees a raft. Well, how lucky. Uh, it's a vast body of water. Water beyond the horizon, everywhere. And she just meets those people. Well, they do not greet her warmly, but uh, eventually they let her on their, laugh, on their raft. There she learns that they were attacked uh, by some kind of sea monster. They call it the worm. We are interrupted by one of the men revealing Galadriel's ears. Then she is called by another a liar, even though she never said that she wasn't an elf. She never denied it, but again, no time to think about it because out of the mist there appears a ship, and it's those uh, people's ship uh, which they escaped, and there is the worm. One of the women accuses Galadriel of leading the worm to them, and she pushes her into water. Galadriel swims away, and the worm attacks the raft. Galadriel escapes, and soon she discovers that one of the men also survived on the half of the raft. Uh, he lets her in, we learn that his name is Halbrand, and Galadriel very quickly accuses him of uh, turning his back on his companions, uh, seemingly forgetting that she did the same and didn't help them, and that it was the only thing uh, that they could do to stay alive. Then we see Elrond, after a long fight, losing to Durin. Durin then escorts him to the exit, and Elrond asks him if he has offended him. Eventually we learn that Elrond hasn't attended Durin's wedding, and he has missed the birth of his two children. You see, the Raiders needed the tension to somehow be here, but this conflict isn't well thought out. You see, Durin hasn't sent an invitation. If I cannot imagine that if Elrond has had received the invitation, he wouldn't even answer it. But even then, he would have known the changes that have appeared in Durin's life. But he seems surprised by them. So Durin has not sent an invitation, and now he seems offended by. That, that Aaron hasn't known from whatever source that he was getting married. The conflict is 
artificial. It isn't thought out. And uh, it introduced just to prolong the episode, to have some jokes and a story of a friendship. Uh, Elrond then apologizes to Durin. Again, for what? For not receiving an invitation. Uh, no, he he apologizes for not being there. But again, he couldn't have known that. That there was a wedding, there was a bath with the children. Uh, Durin seems somewhat convinced. He allows at least Elrond to apologize to the rest of the family. Uh, but he informs him that he won't stay for long. Of course, it's a clear setup for a joke at expense of Durin. And soon enough, we see that Tisa, uh, Durin's wife, uh, greets Elrond warmly. She doesn't seem to hold any grudge. Of course, because Elrond isn't to be blamed for anything. And uh, the problem seems resolved and forgotten. Durin still opposes for a while, but uh, he doesn't have much of a say. Uh, this uh, convinced, uh, forces him to listen to Elrond's words. Now we cut back to Galadriel and uh, Halbrand. Halbrand reveals that he has been running from the orcs. So that's for them not being seen for many years. Well, now we can look at those news, uh, all those news that appear suddenly after Galadriel has left Middle-earth. There, uh, there are orcs in Southland, there's mysterious dis disappearance of people in Bronwyn's village. There is this sword in Southlands that bears uh, Sauron's mark. There is a disease of the tree in the very heart of Linden. Had this news arrived to the elves before Galadriel has left, they wouldn't, they couldn't have ignored her warning. She brought another proof of Sauron's existence out there, but all is, was ignored. You see, the writers wanted to have a cake and eat it at the same time. There needed to be a danger, but there also needed to be peace. There needed to be some enemy lurking in the distance, but else had to ignore it. And uh, now the story seems pretty unbelievable. Well, Galadriel then commands Halbrand to take her to his homeland, and she promises him that she will retake it, seemingly forgetting that she is stranded in the middle of the sea. But her, she must postpone, po postpone her plans anyway, for we see a storm coming. The next scene shows Bronwyn at the village, warning the villagers, but nobody wants to listen to her, they think it's just uh, rumors and uh, nothing worth hearing and listening to. Then we cut back. To, then we cut to Theo, uh, Bronwyn's son, who has a singer, uh, who, who has a serious anger issue, and uh, hunting down the mice, uh, he destroys the floor of the house. Then, under the floor, he sees a tunnel, and suddenly, a face appears, a face of an orc. Then he cuts to Arondir, who is uh, being hunted by something in the tunnel. He gets to the pond and reaches the shore, but suddenly he's grabbed by something from behind. That's the last that we see of him in this episode. And we head back to Bronwyn, who comes to her house and discovers it devastated. Theo, that hit somewhere, tells her to get help. But upon hearing some noise from the tunnel, Bronwyn decides to hide herself in the house. Despite having a ton of time to get the whole village to fight everything that comes of the tunnel, she hides herself. So that's her fault what happens next. From the tunnel, there gets out an orc 
and eventually he finds Bronwyn, that makes some noise, and they fight. The orc is suspiciously powerful, he can toss a table like it's a plate, he can destroy uh, furniture like it's paper. But uh, finally he is defeated by some home tools and by courage of Bronwyn and Fear. Then Bronwyn shows the villagers uh, the, <laughs> the head of the orc and they decide to leave the village and hide in the Elven Tower. Then we get to see Galadriel and Halbrand fighting in the storm. At some point, a lightning strikes the raft and Galadriel falls into the sea under the weight of the mast. She's drowning. Halbrand helps her and in the sounds of epic music gets her to the surface of the water. In a later scene, we see them, unconscious, being found by some ship. We don't see and don't get to know who is on that ship, but we can suspect that it's the Numenor Numenorians, for they should appear soon. Then we see Nori and Poppy visiting the stranger again. The stranger looks at their lanterns, and Poppy explains that they use fireflies. That's another detail that I cannot stand. Why, why they use fireflies? Wouldn't fire be more useful? Have you ever seen uh, fireflies? How many of those little bastards would you have to catch and feed and keep in one place to have a reliable source of light? And look at those lanterns, they are so bright! But fireflies don't give light all the time. You can convince me that it's them that give this much light. The show still tries, uh, Poppy drops her lantern and a bunch of bugs flies out. But again, they don't give the same amount of light as earlier. You cannot convince me that it's fireflies. You know, this whole thing is just a minor detail, but you can say that... No, <laughs> I won't say it. It really bugs you. That's what you wanted to say. Isn't it, my precious? Then we see the stranger amazed by the fireflies and in the manner of Gandalf whispering something to them. Insects, one by one, form a shape, and Nori guesses that it's a constellation. That's the stranger's message. I guess in the next episode we'll have to see Sadok's book. But then it appears that the stranger's power to command the fireflies does not end well for the insects, for they all fall down on the ground. Not only those that he used to form the shape, but all of them. Next, we see Durin talking to his father, the king of the dwarves in Hazad Dun, and they discuss whether Aaron has come to discover the secret that uh, the dwarves themselves has recently discovered, uh, or not. Durin insists that uh, Elrond is trustworthy, uh, but his father does not think so. Then we are shown a glimpse of the secret that they talk about. Uh, we are not shown directly, we only see blue light coming out of, the s of a small chest, but we can be pretty sure that it's Mithril. Then there is, there is one last scene. We see Theo uh, observing the blade Mm, the sword that he has found in the previous episode, and then the blade reforms when it touches uh, some of his blood, some of his blood on his hands. The mark of Sauron starts glowing, and uh, then he hides the sword, and with his mother, they both uh, set out to the Elven Tower with all other villagers. And that's the plot of the second episode. So, what was established in the episode? How was the world built? Well, we've seen the stranger's powers, the power to control fire and wind, the power to con control insects, 
and the power to affect uh, the hobbits nearby, losing the sword's power to rearrange itself, to rebuild itself. We've seen the worm devastating the sea. We've seen Moria and uh, dwarves mining and Mithril. And we've seen orcs, or well, we've heard about the orcs in Southlands, previously unnoticed. And we learned that the orcs are pretty strong. I wonder if, the, if their strength will be consistently applied uh, in the whole show. And then we see the problems with the writing, with the world building, with presenting information to itself. And these problems are present from exposition to conflict and their solutions. They're present in minor details, in dialogue and in whole plot points. The mindless presentation of the history of the Silmarils. The unjustified constraints of Calibrimbor. The immediately solved conflict of Durin and Elrond. And the suicidal decision of Galadriel. There is no order, no real depth, no cause and effect. And that's why the plot, the characters and the whole show is not relatable. So, speaking about the characters, let's have a look at Galadriel. She's still persistent, still proud. We learn that she's quick to judge, even though she has made the same thing that Halbrand did, and they both left the survivors on the raft to be eaten by the worm. And we must remember that it was her decision to jump into the ocean, and uh, that she, against all reason, thought uh, that she will be able to reach Middle-earth and that she is saved only by a lucky chance. Now, Halbrand, we do not learn much about him. He, is, uh, uh, he does not share his secrets very willingly. He is pretty selfish, but in the end he saves Galadriel during, during the storm. Now, a hobbit, Nori, uh, she is uh, still looking where she is not supposed to look. She doesn't listen to her friend, but uh, she is very kind-hearted. She wants to help the stranger, even if it could mean harm to her. And we learn that she thinks that everybody is her responsibility. We learn that not by being shown, but by being told. The writers uh, violate uh, in this way the pretty basic rule of writing show don't tell and uh, we are supposed to believe that um, we are shown only the stranger that she cares about and uh, she does not really think in the same time about the other hobbits now uh, to the characters of Durin and Elrond they see to value their friendship uh, to, value, to really value the, their friendship during it's the reason why Durin is so offended by Elrond and uh, why he forgives him in the end. And we see that at first Durin expected Elrond of uh, some malevolent purpose of his visit, but later when he talks to the king, uh, his father, uh, he says that he trusts Elrond. Elrond himself uh, is... Uh, very gentle among the dwarves, uh, even if though they don't respond kindly. And uh, but he does not respond to Durin's accusations. He just apologizes. He does not talk back. We also learn that he really values uh, the work of Calibrimbor. We cannot uh, really see the works uh, of this artificer. Uh, they are not shown. Just told that they are great. And uh, that's, uh, I think, everything that we know from this episode about Elrond and Durin. Oh, and Bronwyn and Arondia. They are also characters in the show. Well, uh, for supposed lovers, or lovers to be, they, <laughs> they are not very convincing. And that basically all that we could say about them. Um, Arondir is uh, almost not present in this episode. Bronwyn fights uh, an orc and then convinces the village to uh, to move to the Elven Tower. And 
that's that's it for characters. Now, when it comes to being faithful to the source material, I have only one observation: uh, the dwarves cares in Elvish, non in not in uh, their own language. Who's do? Uh, they invoke Aule's beard, but Aule, uh, one of the Valars, has uh, in their language his own name. It's Mahal, and that's it. Well, it's not just that's it for the mistakes in the show, it's that's it for it relating to Tolkien's works. Of course, uh, there are also names of the places and of people, but uh, nothing more. There is nothing more that is related to Tolkien's works. And uh, of course, uh, they needed to put something new, something else, but uh, it could only be justified if it if it would be a good story, something that we could relate, something that we could understand that it happens in Middle Earth, even if we haven't heard about it. But this story, and that uh, we are presented, the show still may surprise us. Uh, but this story that we have already seen is weak, is uh, is poorly written, and. Uh, the writers uh, try to use the name of Tolkien, of Lord of the Rings. Uh, as you can notice, I never call the show the Lord of the Rings. It's just the Rings of Power for me. Uh, they use this name, uh, the name of the Arthur, uh, to elevate their own work, to point to other better pieces of art, to the movies and to the books, and to say, hey, we are the same. Look. It's Middle Earth, here and there, but it is not the same. But maybe the tide will change. Maybe, uh, maybe the, cur the course of the show uh, will be different in the following, ep following episodes. Uh, you can be sure that we'll examine them very closely. I hope to see you again very soon. Very well. Nova yeah. Subscribe right now, you're the hobbitses.